Monk, your Prairie Monk, WAFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board. Today is Sunday, October the, the 8th, 2017, and this is the Prairie Monk Program, WEFT's weekly look at the environment and rails, trails, and greenways, and whatever Dave has come up with for this week, having to, something to do with a prairie on Lincoln Avenue, it looks like. Yes. Uh, just a few other notes to start with. Uh, this week is the week for uh, uh, s- recycling. You had to have a card. You had to have a, an appointment. And you go in by Duncan Road on, on uh, uh, Bloomington. Oh, just off of Bradley. And uh, there'll be directions. Uh, my appointment is for 11.15. So yesterday we got television set out. Like you can have two television sets, but you can also have computer things. Uh, a total of t- 10 items. So most of you that are going to be there already know that. But there's a problem. The When you have a technology that changes from uh, one system to another, and you don't provide the salvage of the items concerned, then where they're going to go is on the streetscapes out there in the country where you pick up television sets because it was just too hard to get rid of them any other way. So if you're going to fiddle with the technology, it's good. But if it leaves over uh, waste materials that uh, cannot be recycled easily, and that's a problem. The uh, uh, recycling centers like Max and uh, uh, the other one on 45, uh, then they're, they're not allowed to, to take television sets anymore. I'm not quite sure why, but uh, you can't even pay to have them taken. And it's a, it's a real problem. Uh, the other thing, I, I, I quickly snuck into Clarence Art Museum and there's a, an excellent uh, uh, exhibit, Muslim exhibit, and we need to understand each other and that reaches into uh, Europe, Asia, Middle East, Africa, and uh, it's, uh, I, I, I can't say that I was there for more than 15 minutes because I just went before closing. But it, I got the impression that uh, it's a g- good thing to see. Uh, so Monday night, I went to the Panama Ca- City Council meeting. Uh, I've been uh, worried for a while about what's happening on Lincoln Avenue. I learned about it years ago when there was a big debate about whether we're going to have a ring road with Olympian Drive. Olympian Drive has already been established in Champaign. It goes over and almost meets with 150 on the west side of Champaign. But then the debate was whether it was going to link up with 45 or with Lincoln Avenue. The Lincoln Avenue portion is almost complete. uh, Bill Gray, who is the physical plant manager for uh, Urbana, saw me at a meeting where we were discussing uh, the headquarters for the Kickapoo Trail. And he asked me if I would have a look at Lincoln Avenue. I didn't realize for the moment that it was in the Lincoln Avenue uh, ex- expansion. So I missed it for a while. I was looking around for rare right away territory, uh, but I've found it, and uh, it is six acres of possible planting. Uh, the the uh, 
remnant prairies of Illinois are down to very, very few. Most of them are on railroad beds adjacent to railroad lines. The railroad line came first, and the uh, remnant prairie remained there if you were lucky and didn't have uh, invasion for farming. Uh, in most cases, uh, the farming has uh, obeyed the law which says you really can't move on to a railroad right away. Uh, it's gotten to the point that most of our remaining prairie is in little pockets along those railroad beds. It might be the, it might be a hundred mile apart. But, uh, for instance, we have on on uh, Heartland Pathways uh, a Downey Gentian that is there with perhaps ten or fifteen plants and they're endangered in, in the sense that there, there's very few of them and uh, it, that's the sort of thing we're looking at. And this is genetic material that doesn't only belong to Illinois, doesn't only belong to the US, it belongs to the world. And uh, the day has come when you can take the biochemistry out of those plants, whether it's a, a purple dye or whether it's a, something to preserve the dignity of a, a medical problem that's like allergies. or it's, it's, This is not only our prairie, but it's the world's prairie. There are other prairies on, in Russia and in Latin America, but they're, they're different too. So we are the caretakers of something that's r r rather important. Uh, the tendency has been to run r roads adjacent to the railroad lines, and then when cars get into action and trucks, then there's a desire to widen, and the widening is invariably out of the railroad bed so you lose a lot of the remnant that is there. You've heard all this before, uh, but it, it needs repeating because we keep losing these little pieces of, of gems of, of prairie. Uh, another alternative is, is to plant prairie so that people will see it. We have good plots of land like Meadowbrook Park or Barnhart Prairie, but it really helps to have prairie in a visible place. We just lost a little prairie around the Breslin Center in Champaign because it doesn't look as good as a, a, a field of daisies or pansies or what have you. Uh, so we have to deal with uh, a population of people that hasn't really seen a prairie for six generations. And it's not as interesting as the cultivars that have come from it. So you can have a bee bomb that is a, a garden plant, but there's a native bee bomb too. Uh, there's a New England aster that you can have in your garden. Uh, it has the progenitor too. Uh, so what do we do about that? We have an Olympian drive, which is going to be a major thoroughfare for a lot of people. Uh, there's six H acres of ground on either side that is to be planted and to be planted soon. So the question is, what do we plant? It would seem that I dot number 4A is to be planted. So then you have to know what I dot 4A is. Uh, and I dot 4A uh, has, is a low profile. So be around about uh, 204. Uh, 2004, sorry. Uh, 
uh, the Department of Transportation decided that mowing the prairie on either side of the road was uh, rather expensive in gasoline. It's also expensive in terms of labor and in terms of equipment. It's not easy to put uh, a bush hog through a clump of cord grass, uh, for instance. Uh, so Bill Handel was asked to do a study of roadside prairies that uh, probably should be maintained, or at least uh, we should know about it. Well, now, you have to understand as to how it gets known about. One way is to be with the Department of Transportation, which has about 2,000 employees, and they have about 12 landscape people, may or may not have landscape architecture uh, degrees, but they're landscape people who, in each region, for Department of Transportation has such an employee and they're totally overworked uh, and uh, they have to answer a call for should you put a lawn in where you're taking a road through a city or do you put in a, uh, a grass prairie or do you put in a, a Forbes or uh, well 4A is very simplistic. It's, it's uh, basically uh, big blue stem Indian grass and little blue stem and side oats. Well, my experience in, in Champaign County, at least, is that side oats was not a big deal in this area. It, it likes a sort of dryish site and we didn't have uh, many of those early on. It was swampland. Uh, so why do we get bootleur or soda, silos? It often comes from the fact that you can go out west uh, where it's more prominent and you can harvest uh, the seed. It's called low bid seed. It means that if you are contracted to put in this particular prairie, you can get a combine and harvest it uh, where you usually have cattle and, and perhaps not even cattle if you have a Flint Hills that uh, may be rough and tough. You can still cultivate uh, and still harvest it. Uh, if you're going to do Illinois seed, it's not so easy. Uh, you often have to have people who harvest it by hand. You get out there and milk the seed and then you have to process it. You, uh, you have a, if you're professional, you have a, a hammer mill where a little hammer will come down and sort of break the inflorescence uh, without breaking the seed. You, know, you have to leave a little gap, perhaps a, a sixteenth of an inch or something like that. You can control this on a uh, on a drill on a, on a uh, hammer mill. If you don't have that, you have people pick seed. And it's sometimes easier to pick seed and to pick a, a mixed prairie seed. Uh, and that's how we end up with mixed prairie sometimes. And sometimes if you have students that come in uh, in September and uh, they're prepared to pick seed, well, then you're likely to get a September prairie. You, you, because you weren't there in, in April when the sarioid grass has, was out or different varieties. So having people in the Department of Transportation who are aware of, one, the uniqueness of the roadsides, and two, the aim to uh, reduce the cost of mowing, uh, or the cost of maintenance. You may not even have to mow at all. Uh, so a, a low profile for a mix 
Yes, a little blue stem mainly. I'll look for that. Uh, and the bootaloo will be there too, even if it's not uh, a big deal in this region. Uh, the other thing that can happen is you have to convince the people who are doing the planning that this is valuable to do. You have a, a ring road, Olympian Drive and Lincoln Avenue and 45 and you're going to have a lot of traffic. You'll need signs on it. Uh, not signs that are parallel to the road, but signs that are sandwiched just as advertising signs so you can see them from both directions and see them from a traveling car. Uh, you need people to realize that this is not going to be a daisy farm. This is going to be a prairie and it will have a prairie profile which is not quite as interesting as if you were to run a, a bunch of black-eyed Susans along there. Uh, so the public has some right to be involved with this. If, if you're the public, you can go to something like the Big Small All in perhaps we did that perhaps even 15 years ago uh, when Lincoln Avenue and Olympian Drive was controversial. Uh, but it has happened, come to fruition with a degree of frustration, but it's there. And now the edict is for a planting of number four mixture. Who gets to decide that it's a number four mixture? There are quite a few people in Champaign, including uh, the uh, people who belong to uh, the uh, Prairie Research Center, which is previously Natural History Survey, uh, and I often have to wonder who makes the decision. If you go to Springfield to, to check out the plan perhaps eight years in advance, then you find that the plan has gone to, uh, been farmed out to a, a planning group. And the planning group doesn't want you to have a look at the plan. So often the plan comes to you as a fait accompli and it has not involved a lot of local people. Did they ask the Audubon Society? Did they ask the park districts, the forest preserves, what might be useful here? It's often a plan that comes uh, where you have a public meeting and you're more or less told what is going to happen rather than to ask you what you might be involved with. So the, the involvement at that level is, is difficult. So for me to go to a city meeting and ask that uh, this mixture include some broad leaves uh, is an anathema. The plan is already written in concrete and it's not going to be changed. We've encountered that in many, many circumstances. The only time you can uh, do battle with that is when the construction starts. So I can remember Airport Road. Airport Road had a very nice little remnant prairie. And uh, so when I saw the construction beginning to start, I asked, the leaders, where is your species list? We don't have to have a species list. It's less than one quarter of a mile. Uh, so how do you counter this? And I've got a lot of static for it because I put like a best part of hundreds of flags on plants that were in that site. So eventually the Department of Transportation decided to call in the Natural History Survey and get a species list. That meant that the contractors who were working on that site uh, could not work on it for a while. So I get a lot of static from that level and some of the contractors involved have never forgotten that that was uh, a problem, but it, that's, that's how we have to communicate. 
So then the, the, the uh, Department of Transportation decided to move that brewery uh, nine miles to an established brewery. Now, that was at the Pesodum rest stop. Uh, quite a few of us had uh, approached the state in various ways to beg that the uh, rest stops should have some idea of the vegetation that was heritage and native to this area. So eventually the Department of Transportation included basically grass prairies at all the rest stops. It started with a few first and then continued. But it's basically grass prairies. And once you plant a grass prairie, you don't get broadleaves in very easily because the grasses grow quickly, uh, they seed well, and they also look good. Uh, people like to see the wind blowing across a big blue stem, and uh, you can see the wind ripple across. It's, uh, it's got some ambiance there. Well, at Pisodum Rest Stop, there was a 30-year-old prairie that had been planted as a result of a, a lot of a community and scientific action to, to let people know when they entered this state what the vegetation was like. Uh, in order to do that, there was involved about a million dollars worth of equipment that came with trailers and with uh, cages that you could put down a a tree spoon. A tree spoon has uh, shovels on it that go down and underneath the, uh, a tree usually and uh, there's four of those spades and then hydraulically with a backhoe you can lift that up. You can put a, a cage around it and it's assumed that over a hundred years the cage will rot, which it will do. So about 45 of those cages were taken to the Pesodum site, which Prairie was at the back. It was not really right on top of the visitor center uh, and planted. So for about 20 years, we had uh, remnant Prairie and reconstruction Prairie growing together, and it was looking pretty good. Then the next thing is that we needed sewer races. The anticipation was that it was going to be more traffic and you need more races for sewage. You have to know that Pisodum Rest Stop is uh, a, a long way from uh, piped in sewage. And so you have to have uh, races that uh, treat the the uh, sanitary uh, boxes where bacteria are, uh, can digest the sewage and then the water that runs out of that runs into races and is spread over the landscape. Well, the question was then, do we dig up the prairie in order to do that? Or do we buy from the next door farms uh, a little extra space for uh, so it's not easy because if farmers know that you want the territory, then the price goes up. And uh, so eventually it was decided not to ask the farmers, but to pull the prairie. Uh, if you uh, wanted to be involved in that decision making, it was difficult. Once again, you had to wait till action happened. And uh, then... Uh, you, you don't get an idea of what the plan is. Uh, so you try to find out. If, you, if you're too rambunctious and you climb the fences and uh, ask questions, then you can be arrested. It's not easy stuff. But, and so we lost that one to some extent. But fortunately... The Department of Transportation, again, working with the landscape architect, uh, 
uh, some of that material was salvaged and brought up to Champaign and planted on the northwest corner of the Cloverleaf to Lincoln Avenue. Uh, we often thought to, that we need to grow wheels on our prairie plants so that you can you can move them easily. But as being somewhat sarcastic, but sometimes we have to move plants several times because they, they're uh, they're invaded. Uh, we had a little site on uh, South Forty Five near near. Um, St. Mary's Road. Uh, it was between St. Mary's Road and and Florida Avenue or Kirby Avenue. Uh, it was it went a little further south uh, there to Hillcrest Lumber. There were two big 30-foot advertising signs in a sandwich. And uh, on that little crest which is a part of the Champagne Marine, there were 30 species. So we had for a little while, we had a, an informal uh, trail that introduced people to these sites. Uh, suddenly they got to be mown, and that was because uh, at Hillcrest, uh, the the um, strip mall has been taken over. The d big drainage sites where there were wetland species were filled in, and the knoll was taken down so that uh, you could drive into a uh, site without having to put in an extra road to go up eight feet. So the knoll was carved down and the prairie plants for $150 an hour were removed across the road because Warden Martin had uh, kindly said we could, they thought we would be able to have a, a prairie on a vacant lot near Kroger's that was there at the time. Uh, it was an interesting site because it had a borrow pit on it. So you could actually see the um, glacial till and the gravel that came down with uh, marine activities in the past. So we had a little trail guide there, and a trail, and it informed people about a prairie. One of the people that came to that uh, site as it was uh, visiting uh, summer uh, school people was Barry Parker, and, and he was teaching and brought his class there. So Donald Barnhart was there, and some years later, he convinced his father to, uh, on Yankee Ridge, to to put in a prairie, and that has uh, transpired. So uh, this was this was doing a good job of educating people. Uh, but then I got a call from uh, Larry Warden. He said he was standing up and or sitting down. I've just sold the, uh, the the prairie to Walt Cunnington, and Walt did not want to have anything to do with the prairie. He wanted to put in alfalfa for horses while it was not being developed. So we then had to transplant that prairie. Part of it went to Barnhart's, part of it went to uh, a prairie which we call Lake Park Prairie. And Dick Burwash has having problems there. Dick Burwash was one of the developers of Lake Park. <coughs> Lake Park has about 75 sites that were being developed at the time. And Lake Park is a cutoff. You take a meandering stream and you cut it off. And you send most of the water aside and you keep a, a pool that becomes a lake. And uh, so. Uh, Helen Satterthwaite, uh, representative at the time, uh, got us a grant that went to the Savoy Village Board and we transplanted uh, some, oh, I think we didn't have that grant for for the Kroger situation or the Warden Martin situation. We were doing that ourselves. Uh, but when 
Route 45 was widened, we had some of the same problems. We had prairie out to what is now the center of the road. There was uh, a two-lane road, a highway, and then there was a three-lane highway, and then there was a five-lane highway. And uh, so in order to try and preserve that, those plants there, we also take, took them to Lake Park, which was having its problems because when you have a cutoff, the water moves more quickly than if you're going to send it around in a meander, it's going to go slower. If you do a cutoff, it's going to have a velocity that causes erosion. So the need is for uh, uh, the restoration of a ditch, which was the cutoff. And the ditch, you have to imagine, has 45 degree angle. It's deep and uh, it's vulnerable to erosion. If you get a five inch rain, then the ditch is going to be very full and after that you're going to see the sides of the ditch cave in. Uh, well, we observed this and watched uh, it having a problems trying to plant roadside plants which have fairly shallow roots and don't uh, tend to sit well in clay. And so Dick, Dick Burwash and I were talking about this and Dick suggested that we might try to put in prairie. I said that it would take a long while to establish, but it had deep roots. The prairie grasses have like a mile of rootlets. And if you have deep rooted plants like cone flowers and uh, dock and compass plant and rosin weed is more uh, a mid between. Uh, you can stabilize the soil, and that was happening on the side of the ditch. But that was successful enough that we got a grant to put in prairie to move prairie from Route 45 and. Uh, grow it in a new location. It was like we had a high hoe that took the top 10 inches and put it in a tandem truck. And then the tandem truck dumped it, but it dumped it upside down, which was rather difficult for us because it was uh, it's very hard to turn over a 10 inch uh, sod, like putting in lawn, only it's much more significant. Uh, so we went to a, a, a farm equipment organization to see if we could borrow a, how much it would cost to borrow a, a high hoe or a front end loader or a back hoe to work that territory. And we met with uh, someone who said, we've watched you for doing this for years. Mm. We can lend you a brand new front end loader, it's a rather large one, uh, until we rent it. And we had it for about a month. And we did a lot of manicuring of that prairie, and that prairie is, is successful and a wonderful place to go to. Uh, we also had the houses on the other side of the ditch that were willing to give us water. If you try to pl transplant plants in the middle of summer drought, then it's not really the ideal time to plant, to transfer plants. If you're taking them off the railroad bed or on the roadside, you're also going to get some weeds. So over the years, we have had to remove quite a few railroad weeds that came with this uh, particular mixture of remnant prairie. And we also did some seeding and dipsy doodling in and it's become a very nice prairie. The coneflowers, which we planted on the, on the side of the ditch, uh, express themselves uh, willingly every spring. Uh, but we tried to keep adding seed that makes it a more diverse prairie. It's near the Winfield Village, so they get to use it. It's near to another group of apartments. 
and is also owned by the Lake Park subdevelopment which bought it. Some of the plants went up the hill to the Barnhart Prairie. This is not unusual. More recently, uh, Ameren needed to put in grids and we did communicate with Ameren and uh, they agreed to mow the prairie uh, late in the season when it was getting to be dormant and the roots were still be alive. And they did that and put industrial pallets like 15 by 15 feet on top of that and put their cranes, they were taking out uh, wooden uh, poles and replacing them with uh, metal poles that are probably, some of them are 120 feet high and some of them are uh, just 100 feet high. So when you do that and you're on sloppy uh, backside of the moraine prairie, then you, you, if, if you're not very careful, those poles will fall over. So some of the pedestals for those poles were uh, 10 feet deep, uh, or even more than that. I think some of them are up to 60 feet deep, and they're over about uh, uh, this part of uh, uh, six or eight feet wide. Uh, so there were cranes and equipment working on that. And when the, there was a retreat, there was also a, a need for a little, uh, uh, there's a drain along the ro roadside and and that had to be covered with uh, a temporary drain. Uh, so, and, and that allowed the access of the heavy duty equipment. But after it was all done, uh, we, we did have a uh, profile that is interesting. The first few feet are heavy in switchgrass. Uh, then there are grasses going down to the ditch then we were allowed to replant uh, on the upside. We restored our, our what was coming through in the next season, but we could where there had been damage, we could replant. Uh, so this doesn't happen easily. You can have a contract which has uh, your aims written into it in. St. Louis, but by the time you get to the person who uh, is working the area uh, and turning the shovel, then that is not always understood. So, uh, when you're working a territory like that, you have uh, a construction easement. That's an easement so that just any old person can't walk onto a a contracted area uh, and and do untoward things. So, but you can also be very concerned about what's happening and you need perhaps to talk to the workers and subcontractors and explain what, why you're there and why you're interested. And also you can uh, once again be uh, threatened with the law if you step on the construction easement. So that's, that's just a, an example of roadside development, too, on 45. There are other things that, that happen that are, are of concern. Uh, on Route 10, all the way from uh, Springfield Avenue, extended all the way out through to 72, there's a, there was a road widening. And that road widening was planted to uh, uh, sweet clover. Sweet clover is uh, regarded highly as a natural fertilizer because it's a legume and it can fix nitrogen with the aid of rhizobacteria. Uh, but it's a 
it's a very good for, uh, hay crop was brought here from Europe uh, to allow farmers to birth their cattle early in the season. It can be harvested for hay for eight, uh, eight times a year. Uh, it it's just loves to be mown. That's how it's been set up genetically. And uh, so, uh, but it's very, very aggressive and it can take over your prairie. To get that out of a, a mix is very, very difficult. You have to be there eight years before or whatever. And that has happened on Route 150. There's two miles of uh, sweet clover adjacent to the highway. And I don't know how we deal with that. The region, Transportation Department region in Paris, knew very well what we were trying to do with prairie. The prairie's adjacent on the right away on either side of the r r railroad bed. And to do that is, is not very friendly. So in our education work, we have to sometimes be uh, strong enough to say, excuse us, but we do not want that plant. At the same time, we have a f little bit of a, a problem with the pollinator people. The pollinator people love that plant. It's, it's uh, r rich, so the p pollinator people are not always in the same uh, category as, as prairie preservation people. And we, we have had to deal with um, preservation of prairie along that corridor. It was a very good remnant prairie and between a banner and Mount Olive Cemetery in, in uh, Mayview. Uh, the university used to rent that area for research purposes and for student education. Uh, that's when it was New York Central, before it was Conroe, before, before it was CSX. Uh, so at each point you have to try and talk to people who in their careers have not had to have a lot of contact with biology. Uh, so with, with kindness, you have to understand that. Uh, the kick of a trail lay dormant for 20 years, and in that time, trees grew. And people like to hug a tree, but they don't like to hug a prairie. So the prairie had degenerated some, but it's still there. <coughs> when a new ditch was needed for a wide road, Room was made for the ditch and the gusset at the bottom of the ditch and up the other side. Uh, some of that soil was taken to the forest preserve where it will have uh, capacity and seed to recreate a, what's almost like a remnant prairie. Uh, so we're not without people who have sympathy and understanding of what we're trying to do and why. Uh, so about 50 tandem truckloads of soil were put in that direction. Uh, the soil, unfortunately, is disturbed uh, longitudinally. It's easier to uh, put a laser beam on your bulldozer and fashion it longitudinally. In actual fact, if you're only going to remove four inches of soil to make your ditch, it's more successful from a prairie preservation point of view to take the four inches off with a high hoe sitting on the side of the road. Uh, that's more costly. Uh, but the longitudinal one leaves the soil re-sculpted and very disturbed. and so you anticipate a uh, huge growth of weeds. So, well, that's happening. And you can plant back. Uh, so there's a profile. 
Now let's follow you through a profile. Say you're on 150 and you, you have a, an area on the farmland side that can be planted to brown grass and fescues and typical roadside. The road was raised up two feet because there was a bird bath there. If you had a, a three inches of rain, you, you, the site was lower and you would have to drive through the water. Uh, so the road was risen up by two feet, and then there's a, a, a berm that goes down from the roadside edge to the new ditch, which is, you have to imagine that 150 is now wider. And then that area down to the gusset or the, the bottom of the ditch is basically plants that can be mown regularly. But unfortunately, they're usually mown with a bush hog that has 15 feet. And the, the roadside, three feet, was probably all that's necessary to mow for travelers' ambience. If you don't mow, there's always 25 cell phones out there and calling up to say, why didn't you bow the edge? Mm. So, so we have a difficulty there that we have to deal with. So those plants are a little different. But then on the upside, we're often allowed to plant plants that are prairie and it's seed, not, not plants. You can do transplants too, but it's more expensive. Uh, so then you, you can go back to the natural prairie if there's any room left between the road widening and the uh, railroad bed. And then if you have a very wide bed, which the Kickapoo Trail is wide for EPA reasons, for ADA reasons, then there's very little prairie left of our remnant prairie that was we had hoped to save by going to the uh, Rail Banking Act and uh, the Surface Transportation Board in Washington to organize uh, an interim trail use agreement. Trail use agreement was basically for bicycles who were buying these beds and having problems, so the railroads uh, wanting to save their railroad right away made a deal with the bicycle people and the hiking people and the nature people to, to preserve the prairie. Uh, they could come back and buy it back again and, and reconstruct the railroad, but they would quiet the titles and uh, save the bridges, which are usually taken out in case somebody has an accident or, uh, on a tall bridge or even a short bridge. So you, you, can, you can work at this if you uh, have some sort of opportunity to work with the uh, planning and the engineering. Once the plan is put into action, uh, the construction people are held to all sorts of constraints. And if you want to change the constraint, you have to go uh, through a whole process that may delay the completion of the the contract. Uh, it, it's very difficult to to get your word in there if, if the local people who are prairie people are not involved in the process. Uh, what happens then is they wait till there's a start and you ask questions about why this and that and so. And that can be very embarrassing and uh, it, it can give you a, a bad reputation, but uh, you have to realize that this is uh, trying to preserve uh, prairie m grasses, there's about six of them, and uh, broadleaf plants, and there's about a, a hundred of them. You're not going to get them all in one place. You're certainly not going to get them in a long, skinny a railroad bed, you're going to sample that. Imagine that it was in uh, 1820 and you could sample 
uh, uh, thousands of acres of ground, then you would encounter little clumps of uh, purple gentian or other plants. The, some of them are more rare than others. There are some that are quite uh, willing to to grow in rough, tough places and uh, be rather friendly. No matter what you have, it's not going to be as friendly as a garden. It's going to hay off at this time of the year. We're picking seed. I'm picking seed off uh, dock at the moment. I'm picking a sculver's root and a liatris and uh, purple cornflower and uh, lead plant. These are all plants that that we would like to see growing. So how how do you change this? Uh, it's a massive thing to 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 go to Lincoln. Uh, extension. It's a huge road. It's a probably four-lane road, and it's a, a highway that's going to allow people to access from Olympian Drive. Olympian Drive is going to go over the railroad line with a huge bridge that will still allow the railroad line to work with several lines if necessary. Uh, and we'll have traffic. So can you represent the prairie that is down to very, very little left? Well, perhaps you have to say it's a fait accompli. Well, better luck next time, but I've been here long enough to see uh, these remnants and the possibility for replacement just disappear. And uh, so then you have to get to be bold enough to go to the city council and I have to decide almost now to to ask the city council if they would put a moratorium on the planting of that ground until it was decided to uh, see if they could not uh, include some of the broadleaf plants. So then I have uh, uh, pages of, of number four mix and it's number four A mix as far as I understand. Number 4A is a very simplistic prairie. It's basically a little blue stem and, and Baudelaire. Though both of them grow about two feet high or three feet high at the most. And they don't have to be mown. So this saves the Department of Transportation money and uh, uh, it gives the public a, a little bit of access to some grasses. It is not a tall grass prairie. It uh, doesn't include big blue stem and Indian grass and uh, cord grass and switch grass. Then switch grass comes up for discussion. Uh, when you plant these plants, you need to know how many seeds per pound. And unfortunately, switch grass, it, it's, uh, it's regarded highly because it stays up over winter. A big blue stem and uh, Indian grass uh, have a tendency to drop down uh, in winter time, and, and if you're a prairie nut and you know that that's happening, then it's, it's wonderful. But if you uh, people who are used to gardening, then this is ugly. Uh, so we don't have those tall grasses that would have been part of the Grand Prairie in there. Uh, if you plant it heavy enough, then you're going to get a, a situation where you cannot dipsy doodle other seed in afterwards. You may be able to transplant some plants if you can go to Mason City or somewhere and beg them for three year old plants. Then you've got to deal with the rabbits and the squirrels and the, all the others. So, what we're asking for is planting at this time. Why is it important to do it at this time? is because uh, a tu Truac or Novak drill, which is a drill that's very different from a farm drill. A farm drill has little cups and you put your soybeans or your corn in it and they drop down a dropper very easily. But prairie seed is often very fluffy. So you have to have a, a seed box with uh, sort of cogs that push this uh, fluffy material down the, 
the uh, droppers, and the droppers need to be wide. They need to be two inches wide so that it will drop. And then that uh, goes into a little trough, and uh, there's a tamping wheels behind it that cover it up. So uh, to plant at this time, you have the advantage of that mechanism. Uh, if you dipsy doodle in later, that's okay, but you have to have more f seed because it's going to sit there for a while dry and shrivel up until it gets the right rain or, or what have you. It uh, may be eaten by the various insects and whatever that like it. Uh, and uh, so if it, if it rains, it's going to wash away. Uh, so it's advantageous to plant with a drill at this time. Uh, sometimes it's a hydro seed. You, you spew it out as if you mixed up your seed in your mouth with a bunch of, of mulch and spewed it out over the, over the ground. Uh, so so uh, uh, we have some choices here, and, and, and it's not too invasive to talk about it. So. I'm still looking. I'm watching Bill Handel, who's been doing surveys for the Department of Transportation to see where these gems of the prairie are. He has some photographs and he has articles that relate. Uh, I'm going to probably be mean enough to, to keep asking questions about these prairies and I hope you will be there too. Uh, go to places like Meadowbrook and, and see what a prairie looks like when it's reconstructed. And it's, I think we're near to the end. This is Dave Monk, Prairie Monk, WFT Champaign, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board. And as always, the views and opinions expressed are solely those of the speakers and no one else.